Uh, welcome everybody to the March 2019 uh, uh, Board of Commissioners meeting for the Chittenden Solid Waste District. Um, the first item on the agenda is the agenda. I, we do have a couple of changes we're making to that. Um, we're actually going to have two executive sessions this evening, uh, one up front here um, to discuss uh, board procedure as well as some personnel issues. Um, and then, uh, and anything else in that? There was one other thing in um, that. Legal, right? legal. Legal issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a, an executive session near the end, uh, you know, after uh, other business um, uh, for an item regarding contracts. So. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to be doing that, and then we're going to move. Right. There's one other the um, a change I'd like to recommend that we swap items eight and nine. So um, to have the future MRF site search and analyses discussion as item eight, and the fiscal 20 budget overview as item nine. Okay. And unless there's any objection to that, we'll proceed that way. Okay. Great. Um, next is the uh, public comment uh, period, and we do have some, members, do of have some members of the public. Would uh, you like to make any comments at this point in time? I'm good. Okay. Um, if something comes up that you'd like to comment on, as a, you know, during our board, I'll give you time. Um, during our agenda, I'll give you time to speak. Um, okay, and then next is the executive session, I believe. Um, do we I move right. the Board of Commissioners of the Chittenden Solid Waste District go into executive session to discuss personnel issues and to discuss confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the Board of Commissioners where premature general knowledge would clearly place the district, its member municipalities, and other public bodies or persons involved at a substantial disadvantage and to permit staff and the solid waste district attorneys to be present for this session. Second. Okay. And I'm actually going to ask if it's okay. For the first part of the executive session, I want this just to be a board, so no staff. Uh, for the second part of it, we will call in uh, the appropriate staff for that. If that's okay. With that's the fine with me. Is that okay with you, Lynn? Okay. Sure. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, nay? All right. Next uh, item on the agenda is the minutes. Do we make a motion to approve the minutes of January 30th? Okay. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Was that a second? Seconded. Seconded. Okay. We have a motion and a second. So additions, corrections, comments? Those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? We still think the motion passes. Great, thank you. All right, next is finance. I assume Deke will turn that over to you. Go through. Um, first is the report of warrants. Um, comes right out of the system now. There's, uh, we're fully um, moved over to um, QuickBooks, and so we can very easily report, uh, print these. And so um, everything over 7,500, if you'd like to know more, this is a pretty easy print. So um, so any questions on the checks? Personally, like it. Okay. Um, Bank balances, as expected, this time of year, things uh, slow down a bit, and then they'll pick up again. Um, the one thing I'd like to call your attention to is the landfill post-closure. Um, you have a report, I mean, a request to approve a policy tonight that would change how that's calculated, and that would um, move depending on what happens with that policy, so that $939 could go down depending on. Huh? $939,000. Um, that would be a problem. <laughs> oh, would, yes. Um, Two zeros. Boy, yeah, inflation over three zeros. Um, so, um, you know, we're, um, any questions on cash reserves? Is that the memo that we're reading here? Is that no, for some reason the memo I had on this didn't get okay. included, so okay. I don't know why. Um, I it may have got lost in circulation. There was a lot of memos flying around. All right. Uh, second quarter financials were um, 
well ahead. Uh, just a reminder that um, we used to do a lot of this based on budget. We're doing everything based on actuals now so we can actually tell where we are. Um, we're you know, basically ahead on revenue, um, slightly behind on, on most of our expenses. Um, the, the use of the solid waste management fee is much lower because we had agreed that um, the, there was a rate stabilization. For, for those of you who are new, when we raised rates at the drop-off centers, we raised rates more than we needed in the first year. We expected to go even in the second year and then use that money in the third year. So we're in the third year, and, and so I've depleted that fund before I start taking solid waste management fee, and that's why we are uh, below. I think that that is not something that was agreed to by the board. Um, the solid waste management fee for the drop-off centers and the building up the reserve was based on the MSW, I think, that comes into the drop-off centers. And that is supposed to stay there and help offset that so we don't need to have a increase in the MSW at the drop-off centers as soon as we might otherwise. And it is my understanding, and I talked to Paul tonight a little bit beforehand, mm -hmm. and that that money should be there, and when we start expending more for the MSW than we're bringing in, then we start to take that down. And there was never an intent, uh, intent to draw that all down and start funding uh, drop-off centers with solid waste management fees. That, my understanding was the budget this year was going to use all of that. As I understood what the, the way the, that was my understanding of the budget, I certainly could have misunderstood that, um, that conversation. But as I understood it, it was put it all in there against the ne that negative. But if, if you want to run it the other way, it's fine. I, however you want to do it, it's, it's on paper, it can be changed. We run the cost centers, and the cost centers need to you know, stand on their own, and the way that the drop-off centers stand on their own with respect to the MSW fee. Otherwise, you're never going to know when we need to increase the cost for MSW being dropped off at drop-off centers. That money was put there and was for that, and it wasn't for the general operations of the district. No, it's not going to the general operations. There is a deficit in the, uh, the drop-off center. So if you look at the drop-off center, uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. If you look at the drop-off centers, their revenue over expenses, uh, in including the allocations and transfers, um, leaves, um, leaves a, a deficit of uh, three hundred and almost $400,000. Those are, those are programs like the batteries and everything else that should come out of the solid waste management fee. And that's, I mean, we're, it is totally wrong in, in, in my mind of what you're doing. It, this can easily be fixed. I mean, this is not like we spend the cash. We can easily fix this. I, this is news to me, and that's not how I understood how this was going down. But we can certainly. Well, Dee, don't we have, we still have special waste separate out we, in we, this budget. We so, do. So we're not using the, um, the dock stabilization, rate stabilization money for those special waste, like batteries and things. It is being, it is countering the operational loss in the drop-off centers. But I, no, I it's mean, not countering the operational I mean, loss in the drop-off centers? I mean, I don't have all those numbers, but I mean, the drop-off centers have been adding money to that reserve for the last three years. And our, you know, and, and we wouldn't have burnt all that money up if we were, you know, starting to go over the edge. So three years ago, we had what um, at the time the district called a, a double bump, right? So they, they right. raised the fees twice. So with the from and again, this was just before I got here, but my understanding was that first year of the fee increase at the docks, we knew we were going to generate more revenue than we needed. So it was going to go the excess was going to go into a dock rate stabilization reserve. The second year we had budgeted that it would essentially break even. So we wouldn't be adding anything into that reserve unless we didn't break even, we made more money. With the intent in the third year where we did run low because expenses continued to rise, we would then try down from that reserve. That was my, under my understanding, that's how but we I made money in the second year. 
yeah, and we made money in the third year. We're currently in the third year. Okay. But the point being, I didn't think the reserve drew down in the second year like we thought. Correct. Or it was, the third. We're, we're in the third. We're in the third. We're in the third. So you're saying there was such a turnaround that in the third year we're using it all? My, my understanding in the budgeting, and, and I definitely couldn't have missed this because this is, but my understanding in the budgeting process was we were going to use all of that money this year. That's, that was my understanding as we went through that with the Finance Committee. I, if I misunderstood that, I, this is nothing that can't be fixed. My recollection is what Alan's is, but is I could it, be wrong too. Is it possible to revisit prior meeting notes? Yeah, well, that's mm -hmm. what I was going to suggest. Could, could we go back and mm -hmm. uh, research sure. that in terms of the motion that was made? Or, uh, Should be fiscal years. 17. Yeah. Can we ask them? Yeah, I'm um, sorry, more input. Uh, let me see if there's a question or thoughts. Yeah. Um, anyone? And Tim on? had a question. Uh, Tim. I'm just, uh, oh, I'm not sure if I understand what the debate is. You know, we, so the finance committee proposed a budget, the board approved a budget. We're simply reporting out on the budget. Are we, Alan, is your assertion that we should go ahead and, and unapprove the budget? I'm not, or, or you want to see a different reporting format? Because the way that we are, the way that we're executing the budget, we can't change that in mid-year. There was no intent on my part, and I mean, there are board members here that were here when we set the rates that are currently there. And if we made money in year four instead of having to borrow from the solid, from the from the reserve, so be it. It just went longer before we we had to increase the MSW costs at the drop-off centers. And we had discussions at one time that, yeah, in year three, we, when we first started, year three, we probably were going to have to spend this. But there was, there was there's never been a, a thought in my mind. I thought the thing was still building up this year because, you know, we, uh, the costs haven't risen as to what they are. And we spend that, all that money down. So are we saying that next year we're going to raise the, raise the drop-off center rates because there's no money in the reserve? And I, if I'm correct, I may be wrong, but I, I think the, the key part of this is uh, Alan and I think that that was intended to stabilize, um, to cover the cost of m m municipal solid waste, not the special waste that are collected That's right. at the drop-off center. That's right. So we would just ask that that, I think, be looked at. Um, I don't think we need to go too much farther on this right now. And, and we're but. not saying that that's what this, okay. this money is being used for. Okay. So yes, we can we can get some clarification on yeah. that. Um, we'll go back to the fiscal 17 um, finance committee and, and uh, yeah. the budget. Let's, let's look and, and make sure and clarify yep. it. We can check, do that. check the numbers. Okay. Uh, yes, is there other? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it seems to me there are two conversations going on here. As a board member, we get the entire budget. We're not privy to the conversations with the Finance Committee about how they anticipate these funds being used. So to the extent there are minutes of those conversations and, and what the intent was, it would be helpful mm -hmm. to see that, to the, if we're going to have to take this conversation up again. I, mean, I understand what you're describing, Alan. I, I conceptually I agree with the approach you're, you're talking about. But, but it wasn't at the Finance Committee, no, Ken. It was, the whole, it was, board, it was the whole board when we were setting the increase for the solid waste manager for the uh, cost of the drop off. And that happened three, four years ago? Yeah, yeah something like that. I think it was, a, it was again, as the rate stabilization reserve for the drop off centers, and it should be in the full board meeting minutes. So, again, we just. So that information would be helpful to see. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this, again, a valid concern from Alan. We'll just ask staff to research it. So, okay. I just have a question, uh -huh. Deke. Um, you've given us a budget variance by program. Mm -hmm. at, at some point, uh, are you thinking that we will also see on a quarterly basis a roll up for the district as a whole? Yes, that, so that, 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 that can easily be done. Sure. I, you know, it, I, yep. I believe we have talked about mm -hmm. being able to see see this on also on a consolidated basis as opposed to right in addition to the program by program 
So um, as of the end of this week, I think we'll have everything fully converted into QuickBooks and I can just print it without having to do the VLOOKUP tables. So that becomes infinitely easier to, uh, to manage. Paul. Yeah. I think the heading on the fourth column or fifth column that says percent of quarter two budget mm -hmm. is titled wrong. Okay. I think that's the percent of the annual budget. Annual budget, budget you're right. Any other comments? Thanks for your patience. Uh, Deke, go ahead. All right, so uh, two policies we're recommending tonight, uh, having been vetted um, both through finance and through um, and through the um, executive board. Uh, the first is on accounting, just background for folks who are New, we have, um, we're going through all of our policies in the district and reestablishing everything um, across the board, putting them in, in new formats. So I'm just rolling through various pieces of the finance um, policies. Um, we've done a couple already, fraud and um, a couple of high-level ones. This one, uh, the two that you have before you tonight are uh, basic accounting, reporting, auditing, and internal controls, and uh, the policy on restricted, assigned, and um, unrestricted reserve funds. Um, so, uh, again, there's some minor changes, but not, not huge in the, in the accounting. It just sets up that we will use accounting principles and uh, do what we can to minimize fraud and assure um, good reporting. On the reserves, a um, couple of things happen. As you can read, the facility improvement has been broken out by each function. And the Finance Committee recommended that that money just get combined and there be simple capital fund and that that capital fund be used for ca only capital. It has been used for anything related to uh, improving facilities. Um, so uh, the, the policy is that that gets combined. It's used for capital and um, managers have to sign off to, to approve um, the expense moving forward to the uh, through the warrant process, and uh, every manager could sign off on their own, uh, just like their budget, and so what we're proposing is that uh, we assign a manager to oversee that fund internally so that um, one person is responsible for the whole fund and can keep track of it rather than having seven or eight people all hitting it and not knowing where it is. So those are the, the big changes we're making in those two policies. Actually, I guess technically I should see if there, anyone wants to make a motion on these two policies, too. And we will approve the policies as uh, presented. Okay. In yeah. both we have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. Great. We have a second. So I know there's at least one board member that has a concern, and I want to make sure he has a chance to talk. So. Point of information first. So the motion is to approve both of them together, correct? Yes. Amen. Um, my concern is more with process uh, than with the policy necessarily. I've been back on the board for about a year, and when these policies came in the packet, I reached out, I talked to Paul, I've talked to Sarah about it. Um, some of the language in here, I think, is restrictive on individual board members. It talks about what the finance board has access to talks about what the full board can decide to have access to. But read literally, this would imply that any individual board member could not request certain information without getting either going through the finance committee or through the full, getting the full board to vote to allow it. Um, so I suggested uh, and would suggest here that as these policies are being developed, the first draft, or at least early in the draft, should be shared with the full board. So as the finance committee and the exec board are talking about it, they can have any input from individual members. Perhaps some people have none, but some people would have input that they would want to see considered and not come here having, having 
the subcommittee spent four meetings talking about this, staff feeling like it's pretty much done, and then we end up debating for an hour over what language should look like. Can I pause you just there a moment? I just want to ask a clarifying question of Deke here. I, I think this is really the first time these kind of policies have been coming before this board. I mean, have we approved this at some point in the past? Because um, my memory's not so good. But these two in particular, or policies in general? Policies in general, we've like been, this. We've been yes, we've been bringing, been bringing finance policies. I know for the, for, for the past a, few months. Yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about before that. I'm talking oh. about pre Sarah. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So policies. Um, do need to have board approval, and, and Amy has a, a list of all of the policies that have been approved by the board. I just believe it's been a very long time since we've really looked at these, and I could be wrong on that. No, um, I think you're right. I think it's, that's it's been, I think the last time was like 2011, if I yeah. read. And, and it's a, the, the paperwork has policies, it has procedures, it has a lot of things in it, so. And it's several pages long. Um, so. And, and Ken, a, a reason I ask that is I, I, I share your concerns and, and I've you know, been thinking about how we can address those. And I, I kind of wanted to know how long it's been since we've really had this kind of discussion. So anyway, let me turn mm -hmm. it back over to you. Yeah. I mean, that's my biggest issue. When I, when I read the, uh, the internal control policy, you know, ask for legal why if he cares um, but it talks about the board requesting certain information the board can get reports I would question if I as a commissioner wanted to see certain reports that the finance committee is getting whether I have ability to do that whether staff could say no under the policy you're not allowed to see that information uh, when I go to the the, um, the capital policy uh, I, I just question a couple of questions on it. One of which is, given the discussion we're having around whether money's being spent in the, in the docks appropriately, uh, what we're going to do with the compost program, melding all of the furs together at this point seems like it could create a huge amount of confusion question whether now is the right time to make that change. That's just, because I'm struggling to follow the finances at this point, and the more you change it, the harder it becomes to, to follow what's going on. Um, and I did have a question, this is a legal question, I don't, I don't have an answer, I haven't had a chance to research it further myself, but um, this, the policy talks about the program manager for capital having authority to expend against the proposed budget. I have two questions there. Why the proposed budget and not the approved budget? It seems that it should be tied to the approved budget that the communities have actually approved, not a, something that's proposed. Um, and I wonder if there is a conflict between that authority in this policy for a manager to expend against the capital budget and the warrant procedures that we have to go through. Because I, I, I've been in a situation in Milton where a new manager came in, we have a capital budget, and he said, well, you approved the budget that said I could spend $100,000 on a new truck. That means it's approved. I don't actually need to go through the warrant process. So I'd want to make sure that we're not creating conflicts by approving this policy and that it is in harmony with the actual warrant process that we use. I'll stop there. There's, if I could, nothing in the policy was intended, and, and if the language is inarticulate, then I'll own that. Um, but it was not intended to usurp the warrant process or the fact that over a certain amount of money, everything has to come to the full board. I believe it's $50,000. So there's no way of spending it. This was merely an internal control from a manager's point of view of making sure we had one person overseeing that budget and accountable for it, rather than seven people all hitting it. To your first point, uh, you know, I defer to the board as far as whether you want to merge those or, or But um, if the language doesn't work, I can certainly, it was never intended to usurp the warrant process, nor was it intended to usurp the, the requirement that anything over $50,000 comes to the full board before it can be expended. 
And I, I'm not implying that something was intended. I just yep. have seen ambiguity mm -hmm. create problems before. Right. I'd rather everybody yep. is clear. Mm -hmm. Can I? Yes, go ahead. Yes, please. Um, Ken, if you look at page three, um, about the middle of the page, it says the Board of Commissioners may request special reports at any time. So you can ask to see anything you want. That says the Board of Commissioners may ask. It doesn't say a commissioner may ask, which is my concern. Uh, uh, we can put that in. What uh, I'd like to understand from you, um, what your, what, how you envision the remedy to this. I'm not um, sure I understand. Well, you seem to have a problem that there is a finance committee and there is an executive uh, committee. And since they are approved and appointed by this board, which does request that we do what we do, um, we're not overstepping the instructions that have been given to either the executive committee or the finance committee by the board. Um, any director can attend any meeting. You can get the packet if you'd like. All you have to do is get your name to, to Sarah and you can see everything that we see. So I, I'd, like to, I'd like to understand so that we can address it. Uh, and again, I'm a believer in the more we know, the more we agree and the less we fight. Mm -hmm. So how do you envision if there isn't going to be a finance committee to review this, then, then what, what do we do? For example, you've made some observations here. Now, um, during the comment period that have validity, so can, why don't you propose them as an amendment to the motion? And as the maker of the motion, I'll be certainly happy to agree to them um, and let the board decide. So rather than direct it at, at management, um, maybe bring them forward for the board to, to approve. You, you, you've got some specific recommendations here. Um, please present them as a, an amendment to the resolution so that we can, we can uh, fix it or discuss it. So you, you've had a number of comments in there. The first, the first I'll respond to is I am not talking and I do not support eliminating the exec board and the finance committee. I understand having served on the exec board for a number of years, I understand the efficiencies of that process. I do feel like having come back on as a regular board member now, not on any of the committees, that there's been a natural movement of control and authority to, to those two committees. And there's an assumption now, implicit or otherwise, that uh, committee members show up to the meeting and the exec board and the finance committee have essentially vetted everything for us. And I'm not implying that anyone's doing anything wrong. I'm not implying that staff isn't doing its job or the, board, the committees aren't doing their job. But I, I think that proactive, I should not have to search for the, I don't know when the finance committees meet. I don't, I'm not, a, I don't know anything about the calendars for the exec board and the finance committee. Um, yeah, that, that's a fair comment. Uh, there's no, yeah. there's I mean, no reason. That information that, is not provided to other commissioners. That's something that we can address. We don't get the minutes. You, you have minutes of your meeting. They're never, I, I am sure that if the, if the commission wants or any commissioner who wants can receive the packets that we get. Because for the executive committee, what we see is what comes to the board. We just look at the packet before it comes here. It's not like we get any secret sauce um, to, to it. Um, yeah. You know, uh, as, as a matter of fact, I find that the board actually often asks more probing questions than we do. Um, there is nothing that we see that you don't end up getting. Unless it's something that, that as we discuss it, um, we say, well, maybe this, we have never said this can't come to the board, it shouldn't come to the board, don't do that. 
there have been instances when we've identified that there isn't enough information and that it comes up the next month. But what you see is what we get. So, uh, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, no, it's a fair point. Let, let me focus this um, or split it into two things. Um, again, I think you're perfectly right on. Oh, by the way, we have a finance committee meeting tomorrow evening at 430. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to attend, everyone's welcome. We'll be talking about certain budgets. Uh, I think it's the last budget last meeting, last right, week. of the year. So um, anyway, but you're welcome. But uh, more specifically, Ken, um, for this particular motion, do you want to make any motions to amend? No. Okay. Um, I'd like to take a motion and then, um, you know, to take a vote, I should say, and then I, I want to make a general comment and ask a question, which I think is a, a, something we might should consider. Um, so any other comments on the motion to approve these two particular policies as, as uh, moved, well, as presented? Yeah, I wonder why we wouldn't amend the motion to be more clear in the way that Ken mentioned, if the intention was to, to be I'm not prepared tonight to redline the document that was mm -hmm. brought, which is why I believe that we should get the draft when it goes to the other committees so that we can have input and not, and I don't have to put forward a competing document or, or make a motion to amend particular language within the document, which itself can be ambiguous as to what, what I'm changing and not changing. I prefer to, to have a process where the committees that are vetting this who have authority can actually have a way of taking input from other commissioners rather than doing it in this forum because I think this forum is a, a very difficult so way to have we, that So let me. I, I need to make an observation about that. This is the board process. Yeah. Um, it comes here. We, we can have the finance committee here every month so that everybody can see what we see, which is what you're seeing again right now, um, or we stick with the process that, as it is. But um, you get this information, it's emailed out, what, 20, 48 hours after, the, after we see it as the executive committee? Now you've had it for a week. We, there's plenty of time for any commissioner who has something to, that they'd like to change to do it. I mean, that is the board process. Uh, it's not up whether you're in the committee meeting or not. We can't make the decision for the board. If you want something changed, this is where we do it. Okay. Let me let's see, Lynn. Has if the finished. board is willing, I would make a motion to table this item until our next meeting. It's not that urgent, and it would give Ken a chance to review it and make his comments, and um, we could proceed from there. Does does Ken find that? Does he want to? Do you want to? If you don't want to, I won't make the motion. The board wants me to redline the document and present it at the next meeting. I'm happy to do so. So, are you making a motion? Making a motion to table this item until our next meeting. Do we have a second on that? Uh, I think I heard a second. Do we have a second? Okay. I don't believe that's debatable, the motion to, uh, to, to uh, table. So, all those in favor of the motion to table this until the next meeting, I believe you said, correct? Uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Um, one nay? Okay. Any abstentions? Oh, okay. One abstention. Yes. I'm an abstention. So. Oh, abstention. Sorry. And um, okay. Were you abstaining? No, I was okay. wanting to make Well, let comment. me first, let me make okay. sure I took a vote. I think it passed. Uh, can I verify that? Yeah, it did. It did. Okay. All right. So I will allow you now to talk. Um, Ken is is going down a road that when I wasn't on the exec committee, I felt the, the same way back in the days when Ken was on the executive committee. Um, <laughs> but, but we don't want to come to this meeting with seven red line copies of the document. And so I think that we, over the next month or so, need to figure out how we're going to do that process because I, 
I mean, uh, it was so formatted the last, when I first came on the board that I didn't even get to sit in on the executive committee meeting. Uh, they closed the door on me. Uh, and uh, so, um, yes. Um, but uh, so I, I think uh, if folks want to make recommendations to this, they should do that and, and send them in. And then the finance committee or the exec board will take those and try to meld them into something and then have justification for why they didn't accept this or that when we present the document back to the board. Um, and so I've thought a lot about this because thankfully Ken gave me a heads up a few days ago and I was very appreciative of that and I thought about it a lot and I think they're very valid concerns and my suggestion, which the board may groan at, is potentially maybe we should form a governance committee. A lot of boards do have that, that uh, they're tasked with uh, reviewing board procedures and policies and, and things like that and make recommendations for change. If we wanted to do that, I think I know the perfect chair for such a committee. So uh, I don't, just a thought, um, I think it would be really valuable actually over time to have something like that. I don't know. that um, uh, the only solution I see to keep this from something like this extending out for months and months if uh, if these a policy or anything comes to one of the committees and we look at what management has presented we make our little tweaks and I can tell you that they're little um, and then come here and have, as Alan has said, individual directors who want to be presenting their own red line um, at the upcoming meeting instead of presenting it at the meeting where the item is presented for a vote. Uh, then what could happen is we go home, we don't agree, we do it again, and now we're six months later. To make the process simple, and completely transparent, I think that we should try not having a, an executive committee meeting, that it be done here, live to the whole commission at the monthly meeting. And we try that for two months to see how you like it. And we can do the same with the finance committee meeting, um, otherwise, these very complex issues that get discussed can be discussed with everybody. Um, I, I really do think that uh, that's the only way to really get to the, a true answer that isn't going to drag making a decision out forever. Uh, does anyone have an appetite for that? Or do you want us to continue with the process that we are, because right now I see us ceding a director control over not only established but mandated because it's been voted on process without the commissioners saying yes or no. I, I have no appetite. I think the process works extremely well. And I agree, and if anybody wants to have a higher level of engagement, you need to go to the executive board meeting, you need to go to the finance committee meeting. We need to give Alan a special pass so we can't slam the door in his face. <laughs> and I think it is, it is very difficult. The, it would be extremely inefficient to try to make those decisions in this form, right? This process works. We, the larger group goes ahead and delegates authority for decision making in specific areas to smaller committees which can work much more efficiently, much more quickly, much more collaboratively with staff on a face-to-face -face basis in a much more timely fashion. If there is absolutely no downside in increasing communication and facilitating that. I will make one interesting comment. I think Ken has a very valid point. If we, if we get the minutes and we have a concern, one issue that has certainly stifled 
Um, if I have a concern as a board member and I want to go ahead and draw in other board members and engage with them and say, hey, I have a problem with this, do you have a problem with this? We've, I don't know if we've done it explicitly or implicitly, but we've shut down people's uh, ability to communicate via email on, on board discussions, or at least we've discouraged it strongly. And I'm wondering, who cares if it's in the public domain? Go ahead and use email. Well, I, I think, think there's issue. some law. Uh, <laughs> <Thomas. laughs> well, the meeting law problem. Just see it if you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> the issue is not so much that the emails are public records. It's that if there's communication among enough board members that it constitutes a forum, yeah. it's a public meeting requiring advance notice. That's, that's the, that's and, the, and that's right. the interpretation. So once we begin a deliver, for instance, I believe, you know, you could send a, a like on the exec board, this happens, um, one member might send out a note saying, here's questions or comments. And I usually, will, to the full exec board, that's, so that's, I usually say, if, if we start responding back and forth, that's a deliberation, okay? And I usually try to remind people, look, it's good to send questions but we don't want to start a deliberation here online. That would violate open meeting law. I, I need so, to make um, one more observation mm -hmm. on your suggestion for a governance committee because I think you were alluding to Ken being the, the chair of that. Of course, if you want it. <laughs> okay. but, but, but the problem with that is that it perpetuates the problem that he's complaining about and that a small group of people will be going over and seeing all this. Might I suggest that instead of having a governance committee, that this should be a retreat uh, for everyone to put their information in and their opinion and hear everything instead of it being a committee of three that then has to report out to us and we are pissed off because we weren't there to filter the information that came in and we don't know what was said and I don't know, maybe Ken locks the door. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, let yeah, maybe do this as yeah. a body of the whole, as a yeah. retreat. And so, point. yeah, Brent, I, I, before I go on, I, I have something I also thought about. I think there are some board members who are tired of retreats, but, you know, I, mean, I find them very enjoyable, but, um, but I'm odd that way. Um, so, uh, but anyway, so valid, definitely valid. I thought of that, too, as a potential. So, uh, Brynn, yes. Maybe we can just start baseline and just increase announcing when the meetings are and sharing meeting notes and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. And we can kind of see how that goes for a month or two. And then if that's not satisfactory, we can propose a next step. But that may be logical as far as like baseline. So. Uh, again, there's um, no action we need to take here. Uh, again, very valid concerns, and I want to address them. And I think, as Ben just said, one of the first things we can do is just make sure these kind of communications for exec board and finance committee uh, go out to everyone. There's no reason that can't happen. That's great. That's great. So, good. Good. Yes. I just wanted to comment also that the, all of the packets are posted on our website as the calendar, so the finance committee packets are there as well. Um, but if board members would like them emailed when they go out, we'd be happy to add that. To Just the a simple matter of adding a couple of couple of groups to your email. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's fine. I think that's absolutely easy. So I am open again. I, I welcome the idea of either a retreat or a, a committee or something. But uh, let's I, let's I, mull it over. I would let's, not want. I understand. Route. Let's okay, mull it over and, 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 and perhaps we can come to some some thoughts. But let's. I don't think we need to solve it here tonight. So I'd like to move on with the agenda if everyone's okay. Oh, we did. Did we? Yeah, we, we tabled. tabled. Okay. We tabled. We're waiting. We for tabled. Kim. We tabled. So much conversation. Hard to yes. I understand. So, <laughs> all right, we'll uh, move on if that's okay with the next uh, agenda item. So, Aaron. which is um, my update and for um, the item that's li listed as past we'll be actually talking a little bit more about that uh, under the future MRF site search and analysis piece um, and then it was a very busy couple of months since we didn't meet last month um, and 
you know, a lot of progress is being made on a lot of different fronts. So, because um, there's so many different items, if there are any particular questions on any one bullet or not, I'm happy to dive deeper into what I've got. Um, the first one in the past, there has been discussions by this board a few times in recent years that there is no desire to change the governance mm -hmm. of the board. So um, when I saw that in there, especially with the Central Vermont Solid Waste District, I was very concerned. Well, that, that has been communicated to them and they also have no desire to okay. change either their governance okay. or ours at all. So it will be a very different approach. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you. Other questions or comments on the management letter? Leslie. Was your uh, conversation with the Closed Loop Foundation sort of an initial step towards perhaps that being a source of financing for some of the big projects we... Yeah, it just they, isn't stated there. You know, you just said, I met with this person. This is what they do. I just want to make sure that the <laughs> conclusion is correct. Yeah, and, and um, Bridget had, I've met with Bridget a couple of times over the past two years. Um, she lives in Vermont, so it's easy to have a quick update and meeting, and she's interested um, as a uh, Vermont resident on what's happening um, in particular. And she knows that we are uh, we like to innovate and that we are um, progressive in, in not just our policies but in our, our actions as well so it it certainly is um, it was information for her but it was also for her to be able to, to let me know okay well closed loop fund is now entering into their second round of, of funding so prior when we first met they were um, had had almost exhausted that first initial offering essentially and now they've reinvested and they have more available and they're expand she wanted to let me know that they're expanding their look to not just recycling but also to organics and want to know more about what's going on there um, so it was her just again letting me know so i could let you all know um, about their programs um, the main one for municipalities is a as i mentioned a zero interest loan so it certainly could be uh, once we go down the road of how we're going to pay for things um, that could be a component uh, maybe there is room for combining different ways to finance the larger projects so she was just encouraged that we are still moving forward on and getting research we do research on these things and it was mostly um, touching base um, making sure that we are both aware of where each other's organization stands with regards to can they fund can they finance yes they can um, are we still looking at things yes we are um, and knowing that they may be a resource for us at some point and one other question yet again every time um and apologies to Rob here, but every time Burlington's mentioned, there's never a deadline. <laughs> so, um, Spencer said he'd been, be making a re recommendation soon to his council. Yeah, well, so, go ahead. We're, we're actually going to ask to get into the lease. So, we're going to ask the board. The district to run the police so we can participate. So I spoke with yep. Chapin today um, about that. So this was a so last week. All happened. Oh, okay. A couple well, hours ago, so. that's a contract. <laughs> a couple so. of hours ago. Yeah. Okay. In in light. Just of, saying, when when you see something like that, it's like. <laughs> and in the effort to fully disclose more information, um, this is not secret, but uh, at an exec board meeting. February mm -hmm. or January? We had a discussion with January. the Burlington representative. <coughs> at least at the exec board, um, the exec board was not in favor of, of extending the MOU. However, of course, I was perfectly uh, uh, valid and legitimate. Well, that's, that's what happened. I for Burlington forward. to bring something forward to the board to get consent. moving. So either <coughs> the lease agreement or looking to get into at least yeah. so again that wasn't a decision don't 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 take me wrong there okay this was just a, a <laughs> consent a thought uh, in terms of no one really expressed an interest in in keeping that uh, land or that option open, so. anyway but that will come to the board at some point so okay any other questions on her management letter 
Okay, let's move on. Okay, next item is the future MRF site search conversation. So that's Josh and Jen. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Roll off container purchase. That's Brian is on. Um, every other year we uh, go out and, and bid out uh, to purchase uh, 14 to 16 roll off containers. These are the open top or the compactor boxes or the overflow recycling boxes that we have. We have a fleet of about 84 of them and uh, they last about 10 years uh, each. So every other year we budget $100,000 to go out to bid to replace a handful of, of these. Uh, 16 of them we, we went out to bid this year. Our budget was $100,000. The bid sheet is on the, in your bid packet. You'll see that uh, Duraback it was a low bidder at $100,444. Uh, our $100,000 budget uh, is uh, also net of our what we sell some used containers for. So every year when we purchase new containers, we'll take out of service an equal number of old containers and sell those. Historically, we get a thousand or more dollars per, per container. So in this bid, we're assuming we're gonna sell 16 and get a thousand dollars each. So our, our proposal of 100,444 minus our presumed 16,000 of uh, uh, revenues from sale of old containers puts us down to uh, spending a total of 84,444, which is under our, our budgeted amount of 100,000. Um, so in order to uh, purchase these, though, we have to spend the 100444 put them in service, and then we can go sell the old ones and uh, come here to request that the board authorize the executive director to purchase 16 roll-off containers from Duraback for the amount of $100,444 as detailed on the bid sheet. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Okay, discussion on the motion. Just out of curiosity, what determines when the other the old roll offs need to be de decommissioned? We, uh, like I say, we, they last about ten years, so it's just our judgment, staff judgment. We uh, have a, a a list of roll offs. We assess their their condition every year, and uh, or every other year, and um, and again, we've historically replaced uh, fourteen or sixteen of them every other year. Um, there, there's quite a range of uh, bids. Is there is there any difference in quality? Good question. Yeah, um, we uh, have had some containers that we've purchased in the past that haven't been the best quality. There's been some matching problems with the swinging doors don't match up very well. So our specs have been honed over the years to uh, get us the latching mechanisms we want and the, uh, the door details we want and the grease fittings we want. And, um, and then we've gone up and talked with, uh, actually they came down with plans of, of their boxes. Duraback came down from Canada to meet with us so that we felt comfortable that they were meeting our specifications. So Duraback is a Canadian supplier? That's correct. Not going to get it any cheaper. Got the right guys. That's what they said. We're going to win this one because of the Canadian dollar. So uh. Uh, it's actually it's the tariffs are the big issue. Right. Yeah. And I find that all steel products that come out of Canada are very high quality. Yeah. Hmm. Durabacks. We've 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 had Durabac uh, equipment in, in Burlington and and it's lasted a long time. It's it's been good equipment. Yeah. Other U.S. based suppliers have to pay the tariff, right? And then the Canadians don't pay the tariff, but the tariff doesn't get imposed on the material that's processed in Canada and then imported over the border. So that's why we highly fabricated material. Further questions or comments on the motion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Now, Murph. <laughs> All right. 
Regent Merck, step one siting criteria. Uh, over the last couple of months, we've brought to the board uh, the concept that the existing work we had is got a lot of bang for its buck. Um, running out of space um, in both uh, equipment and space and just size on the property. So um, we're looking forward um, into where we could potentially put a new facility. So that's what this will be the first part of. So just to bring you guys back, on uh, September of 2018, we had a board meeting. We talked about kind of the, uh, the state of the technology that's existing currently today, the state of technology that we have at our facility. Um, you know, we talked about markets in the Chinese National Sword, and we kind of covered just the basics of where our merch's at. Um, we also set uh, a board retreat date. Um, we had a board retreat on December 1st. Um, at that board retreat, the board had directed staff that they were interested in looking into a new MRF. The board had also directed staff that they were also interested in that MRF being regional. Um, one of the large take homes was that the board wasn't going to make any decisions without a comprehensive pro forma and economic analysis. So um, that's what we're moving towards at this point. Um, three concerns that came up at that retreat um, was for us to look comprehensively at all of Chittenden County for uh, a siting profile. Um, another question that came up was uh, the use of Redmond Road in Williston, um, if there is any restrictions for that property. Um, and then inbound single stream tons. You know, currently we're at roughly 45 to 48,000 tons. That will be determinant of how we design our facility. So I'm going to speak to the first two um, in this presentation, and then Sarah will address where, where we've gone with the inbound single stream tons. So project order at this point, just to kind of give you an idea of our logic right now, of where we're going um, in the next couple months, um, we'll be doing siting reviews to find uh, hopefully either one or two sites that really make sense for the district to look into further. Um, once we kind of decide on those one or two properties, we'll do a civil site review. Um, that's relatively inexpensive in the grand scheme of things, and it'll give us an idea of how much we can build on the properties that we have indicated, you know, what kind of uh, building we can put up, what kind of parking, what kind of traffic. You know, it's just a general overview. Um, we will also go into equipment estimates and structural estimates, and we'll run those in tandem. So we'll speak with all equipment providers and then potential uh, structural companies to see, you know, once we know what footprint we can have, what kind of building we can get on that and how that building will, will work with the equipment we want to put in it. And we'll do those in tandem because we'd like input from each in the event that the building needs to be shifted a little bit for equipment to fit or, or vice versa. Um, and then once we have all that information together, that's when we'll come to the board with our comprehensive business performer to give you guys an idea of where, where we're looking, um, pretty specifically where we're looking, one or two spots, um, what it's going to cost generally. It'll be budgeting costs, but you know what we expect, how do we expect to pay for it, what kind of time frame we expect to pay for it in, and how that's going to affect the district as a whole. Um, that's just kind of the, the step process to start off. You know, if the board deems it favorable to move forward, then we'll get into permitting, you know, Act 250, you know, the big bonding, um, bidding, stuff like that. So this is kind of the preliminary steps that we'll bring to the board. Each step of each of these points we'll bring to the board to further this, the discussion and get your input. I've kind of got circled, secure in, inbound tons right there. That's going to be going the entire time because we do have in-district tons that are generated in our county, in our district, and out-of-district tons that are brought in. And so we need to get a level of confidence that we know what that tonnage will be now and moving forward. Um, so that's why it's kind of not nebulous, but it's on the side. Um, and to give you guys an idea, you know, just uh, a, a point along the time frame that we're looking at, you know, our current contract at our MRF expires June 30th of 2022. That doesn't mean we need to rush into this. We can extend that contract, uh, you know, um, but it's just a, a point that, you know, to show that we are trying to move forward so we have an idea of what we want to do before the contract expires. So getting into siting, um, 
we broke it into two tiers. Tier one is kind of the go or no go, real basic stuff. You know, does this work? Yes, move on. Um, tier two is, is got a little bit more nuance to it. Uh, a lot of the stuff in tier one will feed into tier two. Um, what I'm gonna show you tonight is I'm gonna walk you through the tier one criteria that pared down the properties that we found. And this is really kind of the meat of this presentation and, and really a pretty important point in, in how we're gonna decide where we wanna build because the amount of land that we can secure um, and where it is will determine a lot of, we'll have a good determination on how we, how we build and what we can build. So I really wanna walk you through this, make sure everyone understands you know, this, this selection criteria. So the first thing we had to do was just identify industrial or light industrial zoning, um, because that's what a MRF will fall under. Um, then there are multiple industrial complexes that have been built in Chittenden County. Um, some of them just don't have any lot availability. So um, that's an instant selection if it's just not there. Um, our lot size, we want eight to 12 acres. That will give us enough room for the next 20 years comfortably so that we don't have the problems that we're running into now. Um, potential impact to residential, um, that's a pretty significant and self-explanatory point. So when we look at sites that are zoned industrial, we wanna see how close they are to res residential. And, and the criteria I used was I took what the solid waste management rule provides for setback from residential, and then I just multiplied it by five to give us a good buffer so that we didn't encroach. If it's within that, that's considered impact to residential. Um, proximity to 89, right now we're roughly three, three and a half miles away from I-89. We have equipment, or we have material coming in, so that's trucks on the road coming in, and we also have commodities going out. So our proximity to 89 is important, so we're not congesting multiple roads. Um, and also it just helps us get material out the door faster. So that's a pretty, pretty important one. Um, impact to traffic, um, we don't want to build it in the center of the Winooski roundabout. So there's some pretty significant areas in the county that have traffic impairment that we want to stay away from. Um, and then local permitting. Uh, it's, it's been made aware to us that, you know, if we're looking at uh, a certain town, we're going to need to engage that town before we even move forward significantly. Um, because they may want, want us open, you know, open arms or they may not want us at all. And it's just a, an end to conversation. So that's, that's why I put that in tier one. We, we won't jump too far into that right now in this conversation, but that's something that we see as important. Tier two are kind of all, all tier one will feed into tier two. So a lot of the Act 50, 250 stuff we'll have figured out in some of these, these criteria. Um, proximity to population density. The farther away you get from population density in Chittenden County, the farther route trucks will have to travel, which means the more money they'll have to spend on gas, the more time they'll have to spend getting to our facility, which means that's more money that's put onto the public. So that's gonna be a part of tier two criteria is you know in the properties we identify how close you're gonna be into densely populated areas. Uh, cost will play into it. I'm actually gonna use a little bit of cost in, in today, today's presentation because there's a couple properties that are obvious that are just exorbitantly expensive and they're worth moving forward on. Um, wetlands, wetlands is part of Act 250, but it's also a pretty easy uh, feature to, to delineate. ANR has a great atlas that identifies wetlands and also if you're just looking at a property and there's a pond or a stream through it, it's, it's pretty obvious there's gonna be wetlands there. So that's a a good indicator of whether or not we want to, will be able to build on a certain property. And finally, site suitability and, and perception. Um, just because it's zoned industrial and it meets all of tier one, it may be a high-end business park, and there just may be no way that we'll ever be able to build there. Or if it's a multiple acre, 100 acre development that has slotted light industrial, and talking to a developer, the last thing they're gonna want is a MRF there. So that's kind of that, that last little, you know, straight face test. So that, that's kind of walking you through all, all of our criteria. Does anybody have any questions? Because this is a pretty important part of, of this presentation and moving forward. All right, so from here on out, I'm just gonna walk you through. Does it have to be in the county? Uh, we, our determination was yes. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, technically, I suppose no, but then who would pay for it? I get the question, I think it was one of Alan's points was, if it's our MRF but it's not in the county, why are we footing the bill for it, I guess? And but. logistically also, we have route trucks coming to our facility, you know, packer trucks, and a lot of the stuff that comes from out of district is already put into a large tractor trailer. 
So all of our route tracks would have to extend out to wherever we decide to put it. You know, it's that, that system's already in place. So we either have to transfer material out the way it's being done and brought into us, or the, those, those packer trucks would have to travel a distance to get to wherever we decide it would go. That's just. So it is the same. Anything else? Does that need to be on tier one? In, in the county? I think I think we just, kind of, yeah, we just kind of assumed it. Right. Uh, we that, that, was like, can. that was the starting point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> keep it in the county. Um, all right. So uh, this is the Regional Planning Commission's um, zoning map for enterprise zones and or that are specific to light industrial zoning. Um, not a ton, but there's a bunch of stuff out there. So this is kind of what we used as one of our filters to find just industrial properties in general. We also reached out to a couple uh, um, real estate agents who deal with commercial and industrial properties. We were able to identify 30 properties in Chittenden County. Um, looking at this uh, table, um, on the far left I have the town, the description of either the industrial park or its location, um, and then I worked through the criteria. Uh, on, on tier one. So this is everything that's light industrial or industrial zoned. Um, the next is lot availability. So everything that was from that last list that didn't have lot availability, we dropped. Um, just kind of stepping you through this, you know, we moved into lot size. So our criteria was eight to 12 acres. I've highlighted four um, Essex Saxon Hill Industrial Park. It's 6.6 uh, .6 acres is the largest site, um, but we could buy multiple pieces of property and, and put together an eight acre site. It just, that seemed unreasonable. Um, and there was also a pretty significant potential to, to impact residents. Um, in Milton, off of Route 7, there's a, a property that's 11 acres, which looked great. Um, and then I looked farther into it and it's riddled with wetlands, so there's only like less than four and a half usable acres on it. Um, so I'm gonna drop that one. Again, South Burlington Mountain View Office Park. Um, there's 31 acres there. Only seven roughly are usable, the rest are wetlands. So we're gonna drop that as well. Um, and then uh, in Williston, between Industrial Ave and Williston Road, there's another uh, industrial, uh, a couple of industrial properties. There's significant wet land concerns there. And also we'd have to piece together, we have to purchase multiple properties to get the footprint that we wanted. So I'm gonna drop that as well. Um, impact residential, really the only one on this list as we've gotten down this far is, is a piece of property on, in Shelburne. It's behind the Vovel dealership. There's two separate residences that fall within our, our footprint. Um, so the decision was to, to move away from that one. And then proximity to 89, I reoriented everything to um, the, this proximity piece right here. Um, from closest to farthest from 89. Um, that Route 2 development or Route 2A development, I know that cost six and a half million dollars, was which is exceptionally absorbent for cost, um, and it doesn't seem responsible to try to go after that. Um, the Saxon Hill Industrial Park, that was an outlier. It was outside that three to three and a half mile radius that we had indicated we wanted to keep our MRF as far as proximity to I-89. So, and there's also significant traffic impacts there. So those were dropped as well. So we've managed to whittle it down to roughly five potential properties. Um, these are five that I'm gonna go into a little bit more depth, maybe next month, maybe May, I have to, I have to get a couple more contacts. Just um, for a lot of availability, is that if they're currently vacant? Or uh, no, if they're a bit, if they're literally are lots sale. there. If they're for sale. If there's for anything sale. available, yeah. So like Burlington Industrial Park, it's built out. There's nothing there. Okay. And these are all green fields. Right? Yeah, these so are all green, these are all green fields. This is moving into another building. This is yeah. That's a very good point. Um, so I whittled it down to these five properties. Um, again, there's some work to be done. Um, the next thing I will bring to you guys is a more comprehensive review, pulling in a little more tier two information as well to give you guys more of a breakdown the goal is to get to two viable properties i mean if one stands out great um, but if we were to compare one against the other it's not the end of the world um, but that's my next step with you guys which um, this is what the next step will look like um, so 
this is kind of what we're thinking as far as population density. This is a population density map. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to get up and show you guys. So um, this is our baseline. So here is, our MRF is roughly in this area here. This is the exit to, uh, off by 89. It's within a three, roughly three mile area. So what we did was, is we, we looked at, based on population density and proximity to the exit, how much time it takes to service um, the population around this area. So this white line, which I hope you can see, is a 10 minute drive time to get to our facility and it indicates the population in that and then there's a 15 minute drive time to get to our facility and it indicates the population within that. And so that's is the next presentation we'll bring you. This is kind of our baseline and what we're doing now and how we're servicing the community. The next, uh, the next presentation I'll bring you are the properties that we've looked at and how those kind of stack up to this. Are we missing a significant chunk of the population within that drive time? So that's just kind of a, just to get you guys warmed up for, I don't know, two months from now. Um, so again, next steps, that's, these are the properties I'm going to look at. I just, you know, really wanted to bring that up and show you guys. This is where we're moving forward. Again, this is a greenfield you know, project that we're looking at because we want to build what we want for the next 20 years. Any questions, comments, especially if anyone has uh, other criteria they think yeah. that should be looked at? Yeah. That's uh, most important. You've whittled it down to three municipalities. So have, has anyone made any calls to those three municipalities, the government told office to see whether or not they'd say yes, no, or maybe? I presented uh, an infrastructure update to the Williston Select Board last week, um, and and Craig is not here, but I don't know if he copied you on the email that he sent. Okay, um, so you may be able to. I didn't see the email, so you may be able to talk more about that. But he had some concerns with um, potential traffic impacts and noise impacts uh, if there if we were to relocate the MRF to the property that we currently own on Redmond Road. So I don't know if there's yeah, additional. So we, what we didn't say in, um, is that currently we do manage a, a, a mix of in-district and out-of-district material. Um, and part of that is by contract and part of that is price point. So, you know, we're already seeing that, um, but I think it was, it's not on more residential roads. It, it is on a very heavily, obviously it's off Industrial Avenue, it's designed for that that traffic. So that was the main concern was moving away from a clearly delineated industrial park mm -hmm. to land that is yes zoned for solid purposes, but is not necessarily an industrial park. And what are the traffic impacts there? Which again is all part of 250, but we would do that ahead of that as well. Uh, I'm sure you guys uh, have written this off for good reason, but could you just speak uh, briefly about why you decided not to look at brownfield sites? At redeveloping some existing when we site? Did that, the we board retreat that. that was, I guess we just brought up Greensfield because it makes the, a MRF, the shell of a MRF isn't a traditional, you know, industrial warehouse. I'm sure we could look into a little, you know, comprehensively what is available and potential to purchase that. Um, it would just, we were concerned with retrofitting and, and having well, to change what we have. Yeah, it's not necessarily, um, that's, that's actually, I don't think what Leslie is asking. Oh, so I think, okay. I'm sorry, I, I will yeah, no, to, jump in. I'm gonna try to reinterpret it and then yep. you can correct me if I'm not, still yeah. not interpreting properly. Um, so it's more, uh, we wouldn't be retrofitting a building. You're talking about, just a, a, an undeveloped or a developed area that has been now undeveloped or not used. So similar to um, maybe the old Kmart um, parcel. Maybe what? The old Kmart parcel is being redeveloped into a, uh -huh. a Hannaford or, you know, so there are other um, empty, either empty, vacant or underutilized properties that are already built that already have the roads, you know, presumably have seen that traffic. Um, and we have not looked at that. 
So we certainly can, if there's a list, I know in Rhode Island there was a list that the state produced that of brownfield sites. I don't know if Vermont has something similar. Do you guys? Yeah, so there's got to be some site, so we certainly can. Um, the concerns would probably be lot size, um, would also be what might we, we find any time yeah. your environmental, environmental issues, issues. Yeah. there may be a reason why they haven't been redeveloped. Um, so it's similar to an older home, you know, know what you're going to find behind the walls till you start knocking down the plaster and the lath. Um, so that would be a consideration, we could, but we can certainly look into it. Um, you know, just yeah, I mean, they're going to be higher costs, but there, but there might be offsetting. The price might be really low. That's right. So you know, um, correct. And they may not be the same residential pressures. I, et I'm just thinking that yeah. Good you have a. We've whittled this down to some tough choices, it yes. seems, mm -hmm. and it might be that it would. Be worth at least an initial stab. Mm -hmm. I, it might not work out, but I just didn't know whether you'd already written that off or not. But we had I'm not gone down. We had not gone down that path. We started on the greenfield. Part yeah. of the reason we started there was also in reaction to well, we own land on Redmond Road. So if we're building from the ground up, we knew that we um, didn't feel that we could renovate. Or retrofit the current facility, which would essentially be what right. you're talking about, um, sort of. So we went down that road because of the land that we own, Redmond Road. But that doesn't mean that we can't look at other brownfield sites. Okay. Further input or questions? I just want to say I have the same question. Okay. I think I just want to also point out that it, it will be in those same areas that were on that initial map um, that that won't expand the areas that we're looking at that those were the ones that were identified as light industrial zoned and i i wouldn't expect a, a huge amount of opportunities with that limited i i figure you can pretty easily right. yeah we can yeah, we can look into it yeah it just won't be too tough to do figure right. out the we'll bring that the next the next time acres. we talk we can address you know what we found and if something did jump out and make sense it would be a shame exactly. to miss it ken has a uh, sure. comment yeah ken I just recommend staff make a quick call to the Milton yeah. offices. Well, I've talked to the staff about this effort, and there's initially there was interest, mm -hmm. but looking at the parcel, if that's the one I think it is, that's it's off the market. Oh, okay. it's not available. I spoke with the landowner last week, and <coughs> she was also discussing potential sales. So. My thought was once we got kind of the approval to look at these five properties, then to kind of go back in and reach out a little farther, and that's when we address the town, you know, that, that these properties were in. Um, I think there's some developers in the area that would purchase existing sites and provide you know that land or a building you know um and i think they were very short-sighted in 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 not just putting out uh, an option for um you know destruction construction of uh, a building you know in in what you're looking for is a piece of land that's there that meets these requirements. And there may be one piece of land or two or three pieces of land that have a building there that have somebody in them, but for little or nothing, they will get moved. Uh, a fine example is what uh, Miller did with uh, Garden Way. Garden Way. Um, he built a building in Milton to get them out of the building so he could put another 200,000 square feet of building together to for for curry yeah. and and so those kinds of things are are out there and there are some very ingenious um, developers that might do something like that so I think we're really limiting ourselves to and there's no doubt that this is you know, Greenfield is the easiest way to go. <laughs> and when you're building, you, you've got nothing there. Um, that is always the easiest route. 
Yeah, very much less complicated generally, uh, with the exception of wetlands. Um, but we do not want to lose out on potentially a cost savings if there are to be had, for sure. So. And this is why um, our plan is with this project is to come to you regularly and frequently because you know your community is the best. Mm -hmm. You know, we've whittled it down. We didn't come here tonight with two sites that we're ready to start working on. Yeah. Right. Right. So I, I think, you know, it's, that's helpful information. So direction moving forward, I'll definitely look into Brownsfield and I'll definitely address, reach out to some developers and see if they've got any thoughts on what they can do, if there's anything creative to be done. Other input. Comments, Great. So Thank you. Yeah, just slides. two more slides left. Addressing Redmond Road land use. Um, we had a condemnation order um, for the former Heinsberg sand and gravel pit. When we took that part of that condemnation order, said that there was a 30 year obligation of sand availability at that sand pit, which means that it has to be available on or nearby the property. That 30 years started February 2009. The district bought plus or minus 34 acres. Um, we call that the Velcro parcel. That's one of the parcels that is in that list I showed you. Um, it was a potential area to stockpile sand. That's, that was one of the thoughts behind it. We looked into it. We have no legal restriction for land use on that. We have no legal obligation to put sand on that. So it is open land. The, the removal of sand from the sand pit because that land was purchased for a landfill, would be because we were moving forward with the landfill. So that's, you know, there's, there's other, other hurdles involved. So if we did want to use the Redmond Road land, that's the Velcro parcel for, if it does work out and make sense, it is available. I guess that's what I wanted to address because that was brought up in, in the retreat. So does that make sense? All right, and then finally, uh, securing inbound tonnages, we right now um, receive roughly 45 to 48,000 tons, about 30,000 tons from our in district members, and about 15 to 17, 15 to 18,000 tons from out of district. So I'll hand it over to Sarah to kind of give a quick talk. She had this in her, in her updates as well. Yeah, so um, not a whole lot more to update beyond what's in the in my, my uh, memo to you. But um, the reason that we're looking at securing about that amount of tons, so the current MRF was designed to process about 20, 25,000 tons. So we are already nearly double the design capacity. So we certainly don't want to design anything for lower than what we're doing now. We want to be able to build in future um, capacity should it, should it appear. Um, and when we started talking about this, um, certainly, you know, Central Vermont um, was very interested and more so to look at whether it's an interlocal agreement or some kind of a, uh, just to make sure that there's space uh, if they, they want to um, come to Armour. If they do now, um, and, you know, we get material from various counties already, and it just made sense to talk to them if there's any possibility of a formal agreement, not a... Uh, and we, and we, we both X'd off the um, sharing governance. Um, we don't want to go out to a bond together. That does not make sense, uh, for at least from my perspective, is to kind of have to manage that. And Bruce agreed that that also does not seem to make sense. Um, but just more along the lines of, uh, it was appealing to me because then we would really be able to um, have a much greater hand in the communications, the messaging about what should go into the blue bin, what should not go into the blue bin, making sure it's all the same language, all the same information. Um, there's mostly that now, but this would really solidify that. Um, so we're just in the very beginning stages of, of exploring what that might look like, um, but their exec board is interested in talking with us um, just to, you know, have an informal conversation. So I haven't brought Thomas in, we're not at the lawyer stage at all, um, but it was just more to say, hey, might you be interested in something? And they said, yeah, I think we might. So it's pretty informal. But they are the, the next largest population center. <coughs> just one comment, <clears throat> you know, designing a new MRF and everything, are you taking into consideration the changing commodity market? 
For sure. Absolutely, <laughs> Absolutely is right. We yeah. Didn't no. Discuss it's, that earlier, so that's, just that's part of the reason for the design. I mean, other than we're outgrowing mm -hmm. the facility, but new equipment, new processing is is really essential at this point for that market. And it's not only to, you know, to be able to potentially identify uh, and, and have the flexibility to accept different types of materials, um, but to be able to have the space to experiment, to be able to have the space, you know, if um, someone wants to bring us a dedicated load of cardboard to have a space for them to do that. We can't really do that right now. Um, so to be able to offer customer flexibility, um, material flexibility as well, and, and uh, be, have room to grow, uh, which we, we can't grow right now. If we wanted to, we couldn't. Other questions, comments? Thank you very much. Next. So now it is um, talking about, there are some, um, which one would kind of give you a, a heads up or a preview of some of the budget um, changes that we're, uh, you'll be seeing next month, some of the, the um, significant uh, changes that are occurring. Um, and, you know, he has a, included a memo in the packet. Um, one of the, so we're just going to quickly run through the organizational structure, um, and this has been, was based on feedback from, um, something from the executive board, but and it actually predates me. So there was a conversation with Tom about um, altering the structure of the organization to uh, reduce the number of direct reports that he had, um, and that was continued on to me as well, and what I didn't respond, so was add the number of direct reports. So what you'll see next month is a restructuring uh, for the organizational structure to streamline uh, a lot of the reporting, streamline the responsibilities. Um, we are moving some people around. Jen is one of them who's been moved around quite a bit. Um, and we're also looking at uh, adding a position um, to uh, better organize the operations. So looking at um, moving <coughs> over time, over the next three years, the, all the operations into one position, having outreach policy education into one, um, that change is being made this year, uh, and then having finance administration and compliance. So I will go from nine reports down to five. Um, what that will do is it will free me up to do more of the outreach like I did last week in presenting to the Wilson Select Board ahead of the budget. Um, I, I need to get out in front of all of your select boards and your councils more frequently than just once, once a year um, at budget time. Uh, I like to be talking with people regularly about kind of what's going on and getting feedback and input. So that's part of what will free me up to do more of the strategic thinking, planning, making these connections and, uh, and so forth. Um, we, uh, Deke has talked a lot about the chart of accounts, um, so if there are questions specifically about that, um, then I would direct those to Deke. Um, in human resources, again, I mentioned the major change would be a hiring of a director of operations. Um, and then in the first year, uh, that person will be focusing in the four areas that we, look, we mentioned on, on page two. Year two, um, they, the, uh, the focus will change slightly as they become acclimated to the position to add on depot. So what we did was we're, we're moving the environmental depot to Josh Esty. Josh uh, is our compliance director and he has, his background is in hazardous waste. So it was a very uh, easy move to make. Jen is moving into more of the, pu the policy and overseeing outreach marketing and education. Um, and then, so Josh has the rover and the depot. And then in year three to four, um, the MRF uh, and biosolids would move over into this position as well. The reason to keep the MRF uh, and biosolids separate for now is as part of what you just saw. You know, they're in their process. Um, and I did not want to upset um, this team <coughs> working on their process and carrying it through to whatever the outcome will be. So um, that means it's a big job for Jen over the next three years in particular, but she is accepted uh, the responsibility and part of that was uh, shedding the depot. So I want to s stop there for a moment to see if there are questions or comments about the reorganization that I'm proposing. Paul. What's the outlook for overall change in full-time equivalent staff? 
So that, oh, we should have put a little total well, down. There's a summary here, and I couldn't add it, add it all up. <laughs> yeah, it, it's back, but Amy, do you recall? I think it's just one. Because we had the reduction in compost. Right. Right. So rounding up to one. Yeah. Which is good because we can't fit any more people in the admin building. Other questions or comments? Again, on the org structure, this is a Mac can verify. <coughs> uh, the exec board, you know, started to push <coughs> for a realization that we felt like Tom was spread too thin at the time. And um, you know, we really felt that he was pure correct reports. And so it's something we started way back and continued with Sarah. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's that we start with there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the last section on this memo is on, on the actual program changes. So looking at um, property management, we are we have multiple rental um, properties and the one that we have already notified and are moving forward with for sure in this next fiscal year is the property directly across the street from admin to the right, right next to Green Mountain Compost um, called the Bootsy property. So we are going to be retaking that property. They have a fairly large garage and um, compost does need the availability to work on equipment undercover, which they don't have right now. Um, so that is, uh, we're taking that over on August 1st. Um, we're also, depending on again what happens with the MOU or a lease purchase agreement with Burlington, um, Flint Avenue could be, uh, um, the property could be um, ending that lease uh, sometime in, in the next calendar year, but again, that all depends on, on how this, the lease purchase agreement is structured if we do decide to go forward with that. Um, public policy, I mentioned that too. We also move product stewardship into that program. Again, it makes, seemed to make sense uh, that it was mostly educational. Uh, special projects, so we did want to let you know that we're, um, the Finance Committee did uh, recommend that we add um, some money to special projects uh, to, to try to get to the bottom of disposal patterns and pounds per capita and those we go back and forth, back and forth on this all the time. Um, so we're going to actually do the deep dive and study that. Some of that 75 is offset. We are not going to offer um, the market development grants this year, the commercial market development grants. So it's a net of 35 is the, is the difference. Right, so drop-off centers, um, we are merging the special waste and, and drop-off centers into one single budget. They are currently separate. And this has always been a tricky, uh, a tricky back and forth in accounting um, and, and tracking piece for as long as we've, we've done that. Um, I don't know if um, Brian is gone. Um, so <laughs> because our Wilson drop-off center is essentially our special waste facility, uh, it, having to divide out that time between um, the people who work there, some will work, you know, 0.3 on one day in special waste and they charge it here and charge it there. It was getting very cumbersome. So because it's one drop-off center is the same special waste facility, it made some sense to us to do that. Um, it's, you know, we're, we're working through uh, the, the revenue considerations with the Finance Committee, that budget is going to be discussed tomorrow. That's the, one of the last budgets we talk about is a drop-off center. So we'll be addressing some of that there as well. And then Green Mountain Compost is seeing, I think, the biggest changes um, this year. So, which we'll get into the, the next part of the conversation, um, which is, you know, we're, we are seeing reductions. Um, the move that we're making towards simplifying the product offerings, simplifying the operations, um, getting away from bagging, moving away from a retail model, um, we'll be seeing reductions, obviously, in revenue, also seeing um, reductions in expenses. They are not offsetting. Um, we are reducing our staff uh, there as well, so there will be some salary wage benefit reductions there. Um, Similarly, you know, the equipment, um, depending on um, where we do end up and on the path to um, changes, that will be up in the air. So the Green Mountain Compost budget is, is um, soft-ish and moving um, because there are a lot of decisions yet to be made. But that one has some significant changes, um, just again, as a result of all the work that we've been doing for the past 
18 months on this program. Right. Um, as it relates to the drop-off center change, um, is there, has there been any consideration of what might be lost by combining those in terms of like available information? So for example, if you're lobbying for a particular decision at the legislature, being able to show how much expense you have related to special funds could be in your favor, whereas <clears throat> combining them wouldn't be readily available. Right, so we're not losing the ability to track anything at all. So, so our accounting system allows us to track both by account and by item, so we can simply assign items, jobs, customers. There's a number of ways that we are looking at the best track it so we can pull out data at any time. What, there, what we're trying to get away from is the three people working at the drop-off center who would be at the drop-off center no matter what you're doing, putting part of their time in special waste where it's really convention. It's a fine convention. There's nothing wrong with the theory, but it's a, a, a convention. So we'll know the direct cost of those, and um, we can assign um, labor costs based on the percentage of effort um, rather than this particular person and this particular person's vacation and this particular person's rate. It'll be spread more evenly, which should present an actually more accurate cost. Okay. So I apologize to go back to the HR section, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, the last item on page two references health insurance and more staff opting out. And I read that and I was thinking about the spirited discussion we had two board meetings ago about time off and trying to make sure that we're competitive in the market and especially with all the change we're expecting, making sure that we are both attracting and retaining good staff is going to be really important. Is there any concern about this idea that a lot more people or more people are, are not taking our insurance in terms of what it means for us in the bottom line and the staff that we're um, attracting and maintaining? It is, uh, that's a great question. And there's, this is not a, at all a reflection on the quality of our health insurance offering. It can be any number of reasons. Um, it could be that um, someone's partner got a new job and they, <coughs> or um, pay less, happen to pay less there, and then they want to opt out or opt in. Amy can probably talk more eloquently than I can about this, but we don't have many complaints, if really any complaints, over the service that we provide. Um, the cost is still competitive. But Amy, if you want to. Yeah, we're in the, um, because of the Affordable Care Act, we're in the exchange, so we have a great blue cross and blue shield plan option that we offer. Um, honestly, the opt out that we offer is pretty um, robust too, so we have that are covered that take the opt-out, which is a significant savings to the district in excess of $100,000 for not taking our insurance. Yeah, it's, it's more personal. What is the opt-out, how much is it? It's $4,900 um, for a family plan. And That's really two good. person uh, within that range. Yeah, so it's not so much that our benefits aren't good, it's that when the two get together, the economics are competitive. Other questions? Can you say more about the disposal amount? Um, like yeah, so also a, a uh, great conversation at the Finance Committee, and, and um, please, Michelle or, or Alan, feel free to, to jump in. Um, and we struggle with um, really getting a handle on um, why our pounds per capita is seems to be creeping up versus going down. We spend a lot of time and effort on education. Um, we you know, track demographics. We track weather. We track um, trends. We track um, you know, the unemployment rate has a reason, but we're, we're wondering, is there something else that we're not missing? And we want to be able to better model going forward as far as um, expectations so that we can know, well, what is a reasonable pounds per cap? Um, so, out of the, the probably other factors that you were concerned with. Um, I, I, this really bothered me that we, we were seeing the, the pounds per capita and the disposal into the landfill going up 
in spite of all of our efforts and our increase in diversion. Um, so I really wanted us to find out why is that occurring? Um, because if we don't know what's, where this stuff is coming from, or what's driving it, we don't know where to focus our efforts and our attention. For example, um, between seven in the morning and six at night, the population of Chittenden County increases by 40%. 40% with people coming into work. They're eating lunch, they're creating um, trash, they're creating recyclables. Um, what impact does that have? Where is that happening? Uh, is this increased because we're increasing dramatically the amount of, uh, of multi-unit homes and, and condos and apartment buildings that we have now? Um, is it because we're booming uh, industrial uh, or is it because the economy is good and everybody's buying more stuff off of uh, eBay and, and um, that comes with packaging and stuff you throw away. So before we can know where to put our attention, we have to know where all this extra stuff is coming from and why. So this is the why. You know, we want to try to, if we can, get a hold why um, and other states are doing some very interesting research into this as well Oregon's doing some we want to be able to to learn more from what other places are doing and hopefully come up with a model other questions or comments so if I if I just may in general the the format I've tried to keep as close to what you're used to seeing as I can we have done a wholesale rework of the chart of accounts. So if you've seen it in the past, we've worked together. It's been 17 years um, that we've been using this, and a lot of folks were using different things, meaning the same. So, so we, we spent a lot of time together working to make sure we're all calling, hauling, hauling, and we got rid of a lot of other categories and actually named all of that. So you're going to see some new names and some new titles as, as things are coming forward. But I did want to just say we, we built that together as colleagues, um, and I, I, I felt it was a, a pretty good process, and I think we are going to have a much better understanding. When Leslie says, can we show it across the, 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 um, the district, it'll be a lot easier when hauling is hauling and trucking is not somewhere else. It's all in the same category. So we've made a, we've made a big effort. I've done everything I can to keep the format that you're used to seeing the same, but you will see some different titles um, and some different groupings. Okay. So the next piece is, um, I want to come back to you about the compost infrastructure plan, but before, before we do that, I do want to talk about um, some realizations that I think that staff have had and that we've discussed at great length um, at the exec board and even the finance committee and uh, about needing to change how we approach um, organics. And for a long time, well, the focus has been on making compost. And, uh, and we've been doing a, a lot of work and we're doing some really great work on that. And uh, with Act 148, um, the pressures keep increasing and the more we looked at, you know, what are we going to do? We've been talking about this, what are we going to do for about 18 months or so? It seems almost like from the minute I got here, uh, we've been trying to figure out what are we going to do July 1, 2020. Um, and the more, you know, we, we, we brought digester options to you about 18 or so months ago. We had the retreat January in 2018 um, where we, we worked on filtering, filtering, filtering down the different options. And the more we look at it, the more we li we're realizing that we need to shift, completely shift our mindset. Um, it is my recommendation that we focus, instead of focusing on compost, that we're focusing on managing organics. Um, for too long, we've been trying to fit a retail model as a municipality, and it can't work much longer. Uh, we are pretty much near the, the saturation point or beyond. Uh, right now, we are 
taking in, we'll be processing about 5,800, 5,900 tons of food scraps this year at compost. Um, and we've been struggling, everyone, all of us, you know, you all included, we've heard this loud and clear, that trying to make compost out of 10,000 tons of food scraps um, and sell the resulting product, we heard you. And we are realizing we don't think it can be done. So we're not recommending that we try, quite frankly. Uh, we did hear loud and clear that at the board retreat, and we're willing certainly to revisit this though, that we want to continue to, to compost something, some measure of, of material, and that we do want to continue to compost some measure of food scraps. And I do think that's important. Um, you know, and we want to be able to continue to offer some, some kind of a service to the residents and businesses of Chittenden County. Because that is, that is part of our mission, right? The, to reduce and manage the, the waste generated, uh, but also to facilitate the full participation in the programs. And, and one of the ways that we've chosen to do that is through um, the organics um, program. And it's, it's gotten to the point where the risks are really outweighing the benefits. Um, the more we try to create uh, more and more compost out of the food scraps, we are just digging a deeper and deeper hole. We're digging a deeper capital need hole. We're digging a deeper um, uh, personnel hole. Uh, we're just simply, we're chasing our tail and we're just, we're never going to be able to catch up and produce enough bags of compost or sell enough bulk to be able to break even um, uh, at, at all or to even reduce that subsidy. So I'm recommending that we shift and we look at it from a more traditional model, traditional municipal model, which is our main thrust and our, our mission is to manage the waste that we generate. Um, so if we're looking at it from that perspective first, that's a, a big philosophical shift uh, and that is a policy shift. Um, but it is something that I think is critically important to the success of this program going forward. And again, it's, it's about uh, minimizing our risk maximizing our, our flexibility down the road and making some program sustainable. Um, and that is the, the second memo, not the grand memo, but the, the second memo of more of a, my approach to this philosophy and I would um, welcome conversation about that. Thomas. Again, at the <clears throat> Exec Board and Finance Committee, had a lot of discussions about it and and agree with this approach and this shift in focus to uh, managing organics, you know, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, anticipated and uh, be able to handle Act 148 and the increased volume, but in the most uh, cost effective manner, um, for sure. So, some questions, comments on the approach? Yes. It's refreshing that we're changing gears on this because it was very obvious to me for a long time now that all the money and capital that we've been investing in in the compost facility was just digging a deeper hole and I am very glad that you're changing your approach to this I, I mean I just wanted to acknowledge the hard work of the district and of the staff working at GMC to try and make it work and to try and function as a, um, a revenue generating business model to cover costs as under a municipal guise and that's extremely difficult so um, just want to extend appreciation for all the work over the years thank you absolutely and Dan and his crew produce a phenomenal product <laughs> it is you know well loved by many customers and um, the 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 goal is that uh, we continue to make a compost product. Uh, so, you know, and again, that the, the, the strains were not just on how do we manage the, the food, but matching up the carbon that has to go into that nitrogen to make the product. And that, that was really becoming a huge pressure point. The leaf and yard waste that comes in has been pretty steady over the years, um, so we know that number but it's not enough to match what we currently have. We have to buy wood chips, we have to buy other things to mix into it to make sure that we're balancing that to make the product. And that's where you start seeing the cost just continue to escalate. So we 
heard you loud and clear, simplify, we're de-escalating, and this is taking it a bit beyond. So it, it is a big step um, in a different direction, but still trying to maintain um, making compost, but looking for other flexible options. And the other two options that we want to run by you again, it, we, you, we did preview them in January, but I do want to stress it is these are just the next permutations of potential options. We want to look into these two options more deeply. And that's, that's what we're looking for today. Oh, there's a comment from the gallery. So, so what's that mean from the hauling community standpoint? What's the, what's the board's perspective going to be with the new law? Coming after the Material and should should we be looking at diverting that to other areas or I mean I think that's the question that's going to come out from a lot of the hauling community is now what do, what do we do so stay tuned so okay. that I, I think hopefully when we go through the rest of the presentation some of that may be answered yeah. um, so um, so yes that is obviously a factor is there needs to be a place for you to bring you're you're picking it up got to be able to bring it somewhere so that is the the thrust will st still to be able to have capacity and that was our pressure right was the way the site currently is configured the the pressures on trying to make compost out of all of that was part of one of the issues why we need to look at a different way of doing that but I think we will want to run through some of this so yes. hopefully yeah, let's go ahead. Um, yep. so if we can so again, this is just they're talking about running through what we're looking at. I've talked a little bit about the shift. I'm talking about the need for some change. A quick review on where we are now. I won't spend much time on that. Um, where do we need to be? And we'll show you some of those options as well. And then one of our options and then perhaps you know, moving ahead. And at a point here um, in the presentation, we will be going back into executive session to um, discuss a few potential contractual issues. Just talked about this. Make organics first, make compost second is, is where we're proposing to move. Um, and the make compost second, you know, that is uh, obviously up for debate. Uh, one of the things that, actually shift on the next one as well, what we talked about briefly at the January retreat last year for um, compost was, I started off asking the question, do we still want to be in this business? Um, and we briefly touched on, you know, well, what happens if we, we do nothing? Um, and maybe we can take another look at that. I'd mention it further down in the PowerPoint, but um, doing nothing means different things in different scenarios. But this was our charge that we took from that retreat, which was part of our filters. Food scraps, part of the mission, continue to compost, simplify, reduce the number of products, um, and explore the options for expansion on Redmond Road. So that was also an important uh, factor as well. Okay, next please. And today we find, as we've discussed, many challenges um, with how we're operating today. Um, this, none of this is, I think, a surprise to anyone here. Next. And that is why uh, we're not a nice square, we're not a nice rectangle, we're a bit of an S shape. Um, so there are many challenges inherent in our current location. However, we do think that um, the next two iterations that we hope to explore so deeply, we will still be able to function on this site. So. Um, that's where we're moving with that. So again, I talked about it was continuing the status quo and option, yes. And we're still going to get more material pending Act 148 not changing, that ban not, not moving. Um, there are still some limitations to the site that we need to address. Um, you know, again, the capacity issues will continue to grow unless we do something. And if we continue the same way that we are, there's no way that we'll be able to, um, to find, I think, markets that will bring us to uh, equilibrium. So in January, we talked about the uh, organics uh, infrastructure grant from a &R. And again, as a reminder, we were the first um, uh, iteration. We were provisionally awarded $410,000. We changed the scope, submit, resubmitted, and the um, pre preliminary uh, award was increased to $500,000, which was the maximum award. And the project is, can be 18 to 24 months from um, agreement if the board chooses to agree. Uh, and then the acceptance of the award of, of the grant award does require board approval. What the award does, what the grant does not necessarily require us to do is to to choose the path. So that would be um, our next step would be to investigate the path and then come bring that back to you uh, for more uh, vetting and further conversation. Next, please. 
So this is the, the shift in focus, right? So um, we're talking a little bit about transfer or depackaging um, options, and we're shifting that model to a more municipal model, again, with the primary focus as the revenue being on tip fees, and the secondary on product sales, and then third, hopefully third, is that subsidy. So we want to continue to reduce you know, reliance on, on the subsidy. I should have put that. Can you go forward one? Because this is. Okay. Yeah, and then we'll go back to that. So we're looking at two um, new options to, to look into um, transfer plus compost, and then um, depackage transfer and compost. So those are our two iterations. And the third iteration has of transfer, depackage, compost, transfer uh, to Maine. This is also relying on Maine as the outlet for the transfer. Um, and the transfer depackaging compost has another scenario, main and local options. Um, so when we're looking at transfer and compost, again, it's matching the, the food scraps with the leaf and yard as much as we can to make that compost, and the rest in our digestion. Uh, and can you back up? Yep, there we go. So that would show you essentially where, uh, again, not much that would need to be done at all if we're looking at a transfer bay. We would use the the uh, bays that we were making our organic material in, so we would do that. Um, and then we would uh, do some site improvements to the curing area as well. Go forward, please, please. Yeah, another one, please. So just a quick image of what it might look like. These are some transfer stations that uh, we visited in Maine. Um, again, because we would be retrofitting existing bay, we'd make sure to put some doors on that to contain everything, um, contain odors, vectors, et cetera. Um, the permitting is pretty straightforward. Um, actually, go on to the next slide. Very straightforward, minimal capital costs. Again, we're using that existing bay. Um, it provides the quickest solution to the excess tonnage because it could be utilized nearly immediately upon converting that bay to, to transfer um, revenue generator. Um, people would pay us to essentially store their material to until it can move out, um, and potential for long-term agreements <clears throat> could encourage some competition as well in the hauling area. Cons is that main trip. Um, it's a long way to go, um, and also that there would be reliance on one that one outlet who could accept the material as is. Um, the next item we would want to look into is depackaging plus transfer plus compost. Um, so it would be building on the transfer option. So um, installation of a depackaging, it's not really, it's a, it's a type of facility, but it's a machine um, with some tanks and some storage um, for, to create a new product. So the material will go in on tip floor, maybe we can go to the next images. Come in as you would expect on that upper left, um, could come from anywhere, could come from, Food shelves could come from uh, supermarkets, could come from events, could come from residents. Um, the equipment, would, it would be fed into the equipment, it would separate it from its package, and it would then, so the packaging would go in one direction, the organics would go in the other direction, macerate it up, and then become a slurry. And then that would be put into a tank for storage until someone would come by and take the material out and then in a tanker truck, obviously, and bring it to a digester. So those are the the lovely upper right is the slurry, and then the bottom is the packaging that is um, the residue, essentially, of, of the, uh, the process. Um, so if you can go back up one. Yeah, yeah. So we're, in each of these, these scenarios, we're looking at processing approximately 4,000 tons of food waste into compost, but again, we would want to match that with the leaf and yard. Um, okay, I just want to touch on that right in the next, please. And that's, what one of them looks like. It's just an example of, of what the machine um, looks like. Just to kind of give you a little sense. What is the process? Is it a squashing, squeeze, it's separate? More of a tear, it's, a, it's a tearing. Dan, did you see it in, op in actual operation? You no, know, there's a couple of, there's about a dozen manufacturers of these machines. They work a couple different ways, but ones we've looked at most closely so far involve mm -hmm. screw augers that press material out through screens. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> pleasant. And they work remarkably well. And some some better than others, certainly, but it's amazing how they, they take ten cans of tomatoes, separate out 
red tomato sauce and nearly clean tin cans, steel cans. And, and limited personnel interface? Very, very easy to operate. You have one person with a tiny loader. Um, yeah, it's very, it's, yeah, they're smart. We'd be looking at about two people, maybe. What about frozen material? Some of them can handle frozen material, mm -hmm. some do not. So in those instances, obviously, there's a lot of grocery uh, materials that come out that are expired that need to be handled. Um, some of them you can drop them right in, box and all. Uh, others, you might let them sit overnight and then drop them in. What happens to the packaging? Packaging depends if it's source-separated material going in. If it was a whole pallet of tin cans, for instance, you could recover that and recycle it if it were mixed grocery waste that would be uh, disposed of at like Campus W, which is how most of it's being disposed of now with the organic I do have a question regarding the transfer option and using one of the bays. Mm -hmm. um, how confident are you that you can control <coughs> that? That's where the door comes in. So, so you'll enclose the bay? Correct. And that's what you do. Okay. Correct. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. That'll be important to real estate for sure. Oh, yeah. But, absolutely. So, you know, again, some Does of that, the, um, oh, yes, uh, Just a question. Does that create an occupational hazard of too much ammonia in the air? I think. Go ahead, Dave. If you contain it with a door, there would have to be a, you'd have to put on a, a vent. bio filter to handle that odor and have any variation in the system. Okay. Good, good so just some of the, oops, I have more. Any problems with contamination, you know, the wrong materials, if it's a depackaging, people just throw anything in there and you wind up with <clears throat> bad stuff that has to uh, Glass is always bad, um, and there's always inevitably a little bit of that probably, but other big problems are- Chemicals, I'm thinking. Um, probably no more than what is already at risk associated with taking in food waste or yard waste, I would mean, think it would increase significantly. So initial pros and cons that, that we've identified. Um, the the depackaging, there is not one in Vermont, and there's, there's not one, um, I think the closest one, there's one, there's a few in Massachusetts, and there's one in Maine, um, but this would be the only one in, yet in Vermont. Um, so by taking on that investment, if we chose to do so, that would certainly make it much easier for anaerobic digestion to invest in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, that'd be one less thing that they would have to invest in, and then we'd be creating a, a ready-made product for them to include into their mix. It's, it's you know, one benefit. Um, it does also tap into that very large stream of, of packaged materials, and um, Nancy has, has crunched some of the numbers uh, for that she got from the state's recent waste composition study showing there's, there's still a tremendous amount of of um, packaged food waste that is coming from residential sources. So this would be a way to also capture some of that material. We talked about quality and quantity. Right now we are dealing with increased contamination. This removes that, that issue from the equation. Um, there's also potential for down the road, um, third party ownership or, ownership or operation. Um, similar to the MRF, you know, we get into an operator um, uh, agreement there as well, if that makes sense. Um, there's revenue on the inbound and potentially on the outbound as well. So um, there's there's positives there, we think. Cons, high capital costs, and again, it would rely on, on digesters. But again, you know, Vermont Tech has their digester here. Um, Salisbury uh, digester has been nearly fully permitted. Um, we actually talked with them today, and they are looking to break ground in May or June. So that one is, is moving forward very, very quickly. Um, and it would uh, certainly uh, be, um, make it much more agreeable to locate something else up here. So it, it, I think we'd be in a, a good place. As well as Maine and Massachusetts, there are options there as well. Now at this point, um, I think we want to re-enter, potentially re-enter really into point. executive session. Okay. We have something that needs uh, regarding contracts that uh, regarding needs. Regarding contracts. Um, I, I just had one uh, point of information, question of information. How do um, supermarkets now dispose of their excess, uh, you know, packaged goods? So materials that 
are, are suitable for donation are donated. And Hannaford has a phenomenal program uh, for food rescue. So a lot of that material that can go to the food shelves, food pantries, is already going there. And um, when the organic um, um, uh, diversion requirements started to creep in, that skyrocketed. I mean, Bryn was a lead staffer on that uh, program at ANR. You can talk much better to that than, than I can. Um, but that they saw an, a huge increase in food rescue. What also happened was um, they were a bit overwhelmed, and then there, that became a salt waste issue on the other end for the food pantries and the food shelves and kitchens. So what this would do would be to offer a, a local solution you know, to the landfill, they would be able to divert away from the landfill to this this uh, option. So, no, but my question is, just by way of, for if if uh, if we had the responsibility for doing the DPAC, then that residue, that non-organic residue packaging, that becomes our cost to yes. dispose of the landfill. Correct. As opposed to when it might have left the supermarket, the supermarket would bear that dispo landfill disposal cost. True. So we're taking on, we, our fee structure would have to reflect that shift. Correct. Okay. Correct. Just mm -hmm. wanna, trying to think it through. Okay. Is to discuss contract, um, it's, it's contracts. Mm -hmm. I would move that the Board of Commissioners of the Chitton Solid Waste District go into executive session to discuss contract issues and to discuss confidential attorney client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the Board of Commissioners where premature general knowledge would clearly place the district, its member municipalities, and other public bodies or persons involved at a substantial disadvantage and to prevent staff and the solid waste district attorney <coughs> present. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is consideration of the uh, <coughs> grant from A and R. And uh, right, so the mm -hmm. back in uh, October 2008, mm -hmm. district staff submitted a, a response to the DEC's request for proposals, um, you which said 2008. You mean 18? I'm sorry, 2018. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, which sub proposals to expand organics management infrastructure uh, and processing infrastructure in Vermont. Um, so we had applied for the maximum award and after refining our proposal we were we were provisionally um, awarded the $500,000 maximum. Uh, it is a, a matching grant and it requires a 60% match which would be bring the district's um, total out of pocket if we were to just keep the match to the 500,000 the project price to be 1.2 million out of pocket would be 750, but um, obviously all that we could get reimbursed for would be 500,000 doesn't mean that, that we would only spend 750, it would depend on the project price that we would bring to the board for approval. Um, so this would, uh, again, the grant is geared towards um, having the district uh, accept uh, about 10,000, at least a minimum 10,000 tons of food scraps um, for processing and the state does not uh, dictate how we do that um, so our Reese middle um, did talk about uh, transfer and depackaging and we see either of these options as a great opportunity and want to uh, look into them more and again it's it's the next kind of iteration of what we've we've brought over the past 18 or so months to the board um, and looking more deeply into different options based on, on guidance that we receive. Um, I do have resolution on the memo, however, I would like to um, uh, reduce the word, the verbiage uh, on that. So um, if we go with the resolution, I would propose that we put the period at the end of infrastructure and uh, I would recommend striking the rest because it should be, you know, you should expect to see 
um, you know, the design, the cost benefit analysis, the, the business plan. That you shouldn't have to resolve that. That's an expectation of, of that staff will bring that to you. So I don't think it, I just think it's excessive words and you don't need to have it in the resolution. But that's my opinion. So um, I move that be it resolved the Board of Commissioners authorizes the executive director to enter into a grant agreement with the state accepting a matching grant of $500,000 towards organic diversion infrastructure. Do we have a second on that? Second. So again, I think it's very important to make it clear that, um, uh, and it's in here, but again, this would, in terms of the study and plan development, that's on us. Correct. Um, do you have any idea of the cost of that at this point? I don't. I am putting 50000 into my budget, uh, my uh, administrative budget, um, but I don't know that it would cost that much. I don't think that it would. And then in terms of the grant, it requires us to actually build infrastructure. And um, so it's uh, for building, and it would be a reimbursement. Correct. correct? That's okay. right. So I just wanted to make sure that was all clear to everyone. So right. Further discussion on that, on the motion, I should say. Yeah. When does the infrastructure have to be completed? So they are hoping that it's completed within 18 months. However, there is leeway depending on construction schedules, knowing what that could be. So we could apply for um, extension of that. So within 24 months is reasonable. Okay. Other questions? Clarifying question. Is it possible to apply grants to the match that CSWD needs to cover? So per se, closed loop wanted to yeah. offer some grant options or if there was another granting source. That's a great question. I don't know, but I can ask. Yeah. Further questions? Ken. Ken, sorry. I was fine until you put the period in. Oh, no. <laughs> now I got questions. Uh, okay. <laughs> We can take it out. <laughs> so we haven't seen the actual grant documentation. So I, I'd like to understand and make sure I understand exactly what we're committing to for construction and wh how much flexibility we have to react to what the study produces. Because I'm basically, by voting in favor of this motion, I'm accepting the grant based on whatever it says, and that's a document I haven't seen. So, what are we committing to? Good point. So, if so, what we are committing to is uh, if you know again the board approves the project. So, the first step is for the board to approve a project that um, has been addressed in the scope. And in the scope, we suggest that we want to look into either transfer both. A transfer or and or a transfer and depackaging operation. So we want to look into both of those. So if when we come back after the study is done and the board agrees that one of those projects is the way to go, then that is the one that the grant money is applied to. If we come back to the board and the board says, we don't want to do either of these things, then the state hasn't cut us a check. There's We're out the study cost and we say, no, thank you. And the application includes both, both options. Correct. Correct. Paul has a question. Yeah, Paul. Conversely, what happens if we go through the study, we get all prepared to do the construction, and then the legislature says, never mind, we're going to just gut the whole diversion requirement entirely? After, after we've built? Or? Or, or? I guess the time frame is if, if we've got 18 months to build, probably, by then we're close to 2020, we would know that we can just stop and not build anything. True. Um, we also could uh, the, just do the transfer option, you know, which again is much lower capital investment. It, it, it immediately alleviates the overcapacity issue uh, as well. So with that one, we're, we're really not. Uh, so it doesn't matter. Whatever the state does, we're. The impact's not all that great. So the bill that's in that's pending now, um, there is a bill about uh, 148. It does not touch the ban at all. It addresses hauling requirements, which is why Mike Sill is asking about that. Um, but it doesn't 
doesn't touch the ban. Jen, may, do you have an update or, or further information on um, where no, they're headed? I will just confirm what you said, and I, that bill was in the committee today, and there was conversation around the ban, and no stomach to do anything about the ban. I'm just keeping that as is. But I also wanted to point out that this body um, also uh, voted to have that ban placed in our ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> the haunted lawyer. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Jim. So, so talk about our ordinance. I mean, this, uh, of course, you have you can easily, well, not easily, but you could choose to change your mind and remove that ordinance. But prior to Act 148, um, passing. Right around when it has felt strong enough uh, to reinforce that by putting it in our ordinance, should it get approved. So that would be something that would just, this board would have to consider, and, uh, even if that's an employee uh, that that was considered. Okay, yes. Uh, um, um, the spreadsheet that was passed out, there's a Eight hundred thousand, seven hundred dollar, or seven hundred thousand um, dollar shortfall subsidy requirement, whatever. Um, is the vast majority of that uh, making compost? Short, um, it's a combination of the cost of compost and the combination of the allocations capital. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on what's the bottom, but yes, compost is definitely more expensive. Right. Then, so I mean, we could think about just stockpiling leaves in a big field, and uh, and not doing anything with them, and saving five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. Well, two thirds of the allocation on that one is allocations. Just so the allocations pick up two thirds of that. That number that you just referred to, the upper, the lower end of that subsidy. Uh, Leaf, with Leaf and Yard, we would still need to manage it and move it and turn it and, and do something. We can't just throw it in a, in a field, but we would. it would be much, obviously, less labor-intensive and, and costly without the food scraps. Even less costly is not composting at all. Just transferring everything is what you're saying. Correct. Yes. Or, or depackaging and slurring. Right. And we have we've not, just because of time, Modeled what happens if you stop composting? I don't know. I just but and and it didn't appear to be the will of the board at, at that point. It wasn't at the retreat, though. right? Right. So, which is why we didn't model that. But it's it's labor intensive and it's capital intensive. Further mm -hmm. questions? questions. Is, is there a, an option to produce the slurry without a depack? <laughs> Machine, can you just can you produce that slurry just from food scraps? You still have, mm -hmm. Well, you still have to get the contamination out. Um, I'm I mean, just the, thinking the, the OPEX is it, it works better the more you put in there, you know. So, ugh, Dan, I don't know. I, I mean, you can grind food waste, sure, and create a pulpy like material, but the, well, it would not be, I don't believe it would be digested. Right? So, in order to have the most options for where that. Yeah, I'm saying if the market is for these digesters and that market seems to be growing, then is there... Does this, does this affect there... our ability to, to take the grant? I mean, I, we're kind of getting... I'm worried okay. to get down to the Well, no, because... I don't... Because you're going to... The, the um, authorization is for you to negotiate an agreement, and you've told us... The agreement you want to negotiate is for looking at two options. Maybe I've, I've misunderstood the process, but what? I'm trying to say the other right. The authorization is is simply to accept the grant award from the state. I know, but the grant award imposes some obligation on us. Process tons. Process yeah. tons. Pardon me? Process tons. Process 10,000 tons of food waste. Doesn't say half. Okay. 
we, we have presented in the scope of the grant these two options that we want to investigate further. So if we decide that that is not how we want to do that, again, we don't have access, we wouldn't have access to the $500,000. That's okay <laughs> if we decide to go a different route. But if we want access to the $500,000, these are the two that we've presented at this point. But I think also, yeah, I'm going to stop there. Further questions, comments, before we take a vote? Okay, you, you said you don't have a scope, a cost of the scope. No, we do. It's in, it's in um, the award. No, I'm sorry. I'm your, the oh, oh, for the study. For the study. We have not gone out to bid for that yet, no. Okay, that's the hard but we're, we're accepting the grant based. We're going to spend X if we vote to accept. We're going to spend, we're signing up to spend X if we apply for, if we accept the grant. But we don't know what X is. <coughs> well, I've put 50000 in my. I was going to say, could you, could you just give me a high low so I know what my worst case, best case is? I would say the low is probably twenty-five. The high could be fifty. Would we, is there any appetite to, de, to, off, to, to limit that? Uh, by cutting back on the special project numbers that you've allocated? Are, are there other pressure valves? I just don't want to see the budget get busted. Do you know what I mean? Sorry. And is this within budgeted spend? We, so this isn't incremental to the budget? This, well, this is budgeted in fiscal 20, the 50,000, um, as is the, the Nancy study. So we could, um, instead of, <coughs> there was uh, $40,000 that was set aside to get us have a study done to to do a startup for a company who could divert what you were on the committee for thank goodness glavel is gone um that 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 forty thousand could be applied to this instead of doing the study on why is all of this um, food waste going up and up and up in chittenden county that has a lower priority than this would so we could use that 40000 But the budget that the Finance Committee is going to bring forward is going to include the proposed spend for this. It will include uh, $50,000 for a com for consultant. And the 40000 which Michelle is talking about, is in this current year budget. So there's 40 potentially in this current year budget, 50 in the next. Okay. Further questions? Again, Finance Committee tomorrow uh, afternoon. <laughs> 30. Be there. Be, be there. square. Look at the, the agendas on your tablets, the minutes from the meetings, all of the past board packets are right there for you to see. Okay. Um, Further. We, we have great little um, green wraps. Can you plan them further in advance? It has been, and you know the the difficulty. Mm -hmm. it's like there's again, nothing on the I know. calendar for next month. It's well, been, yeah, it's, it's been a on the website, I believe. Water. It's on well, the we website, have... but we did not send it out to everyone so that they would see it. No, as tomorrow's meeting is on the calendar. I'm just saying, but it's easier. Like I gotta, unfortunately, I gotta. Can we get back travel. to the question? Yeah. So, all right. Further questions on the on the grant, on the motion, I should say, regarding the grant. Okay, I think we're ready to vote. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. I could uh, make sure, was that just two? So, Essex, well, actually, Essex, Essex Junction and uh, Hinesburg. Oh, so was there anyone else? No. Okay, I believe the motion passes then. Make sure. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, next other on the agenda, other business. just uh, other, other, business. other business. Anything under other business? And anything on program updates? Any questions on the program updates? All right. Motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. <laughs> second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all very much.